Uh, let's see, last time we left off with uh, going through the separation of variables process. And what we'll do today is we will wrap up our, our discussion of separation of variables. Um, and in fact, we're going to be wrapping up today our discussion of um, steady state conduction in 1D and, and 2D now. Uh, next time we're going to start talking about transient conduction. So we'll get as far as we can on the separation of variables. I think there's more to talk about than I have time to today. We'll just go as far as we can. If there's anything left, um, I don't think there's going to be like major things left after lecture today. But if there is anything, uh, particularly on this idea of superposition, I'll post the full notes and you can just have a look at that. I probably wouldn't include that type of problem on a test then, but you can just have them for your future reference. Uh, okay, so let's finish up with separation of variables. Remember what we did uh, last time and actually started the time before was we have this two-dimensional problem. We have boundary conditions in both directions. We went through the trouble of stating what our PDE is. Remember, our PDE is going to be uh, homogeneous. It's a criteria here. Uh, we don't include things like boundary conditions in the PDE itself, which showed up on the lecture quiz and a number of people missed. Uh, the PDE should only be looking at what's happening in a control volume inside the domain, not on the boundaries. Then we have four boundary conditions, two in X and two in Y. And we had the criteria that two, uh, or in one direction, the boundary conditions need to both be homogeneous, which is the case for X equals zero. We have a temperature of zero and we have a heat flux of zero, which makes it homogeneous. Um, so let's briefly recap the steps that we took. So recap, there are, so far we've gone through, I think, five or close to six steps, maybe five that we've actually talked about. So the steps that you go through for this, by the way, there's seven steps, we have two more. <laughs> uh, okay, so steps are, first we're gonna check requirements. It has to be homogeneous, we have to have boundary conditions homogeneous, as I said. Step two, we're gonna separate the variables. And our, our model of this, our assumption of this is that we can take the product of two independent functions, right? multiply them together, and that's our, that's our separation. So we're going to find a solution where we can multiply these two things together and it's valid. Uh, we have this constant lambda or lambda squared that relates the ODEs to each other. In one case, it has to be positive. In one case, it has to be negative. So the positive is going to go with the problem that's in the homogeneous direction, right, in the x direction for, for this example. Um, and then the negative goes for the non-homogeneous problem. So we separate, we have ODEs, then we're solving this eigenproblem. And the eigenproblem arises in the homogeneous direction, where we have, now our Tx solution has some uh, periodic function that goes with it. For this, it's sines and cosines. So some constant times uh, sine of lambda x plus a constant times cosine of lambda x, and then we enforce the boundary conditions in the uh, homogeneous direction. When you enforce the boundary conditions in the homogeneous direction, we get our eigenvalues. Right? We have our, uh, the eigenproblem, the eigenfunction here, and then the eigenvalues here. Oops, and then this is the eigencondition, right? So all those different vocabulary things that we highlighted. Step four, we solve the non-homogeneous problem for every eigenvalue. And there, what we're doing is uh, coming up with our, our temperature, general temperature solution for y with unknown constants. So we have now our function only in x, our function only in y. Uh, and then we determine the temperature solutions for each of these. And this is kind of where we left off. OK. So there's a lot here. And as we go back through this or keep, keep moving, I think I'll, we'll zoom out a little bit again and think about what we're actually doing. Um, so one curious thing to keep in mind as we're going through this, by the way, is it's curious to me that you look at this problem, this problem here. What in this problem indicates to you that the solution would involve sines and cosines? <laughs> I, like you stare at this and yeah, not much, right? It's not really obvious that sines and cosines should be involved in the solution in any way. Um, if anything, you'd look at this and maybe you start drawing like ISO lines. Okay, I know the temperature up here is, is TH and I know the temperature here is T0, so there's this little discontinuity at this corner, but the, you know, the temperature contours might look something like this. 
uh, where you start getting these you know, curves that are going to be adiabatic at these boundaries. But that does not in any way look to me like sines and cosines. So really, the, I think a really important thing to understand about this kind of mess is that we are using the sines and cosine functions as a tool to help us build a model of temperature. And that tool is saying, uh, I need some blank space here, that tool is saying uh, what we're going to do for step six is if I have a sine function in the homogeneous direction, let me just sketch this out. So I have a sine function, and we're going from, say, 0 to, was it w? This is just saying, if I pick a sine function and I get it to, to line up, right, so that my period is, oh, that's terrible. My period is like this. Uh, and then I have another sine function, and it's maybe twice the, the frequency, right, like this. And so on, like you just have these, these sine functions that have the different periodicity with them. It's saying I can take all of these individual sine functions, apply the right coefficient to them, add them together, and get a, a new function. That's what we're doing. So when we go through and we find the lambdas, we're, all we're doing is we're finding the right scale for these poorly drawn sine functions to get them to line up with our domain. If we say temperature has to be 0 at x equals 0, that's saying I better use a sine function as opposed to a cosine function. Right? That's why the cosine went away. If we say that the derivative needs to be 0 at w, well, that's going to tell me something about the scale and where this, where this curve needs to line up. Right? So we're just, with our homogeneous system, trying to find the values of lambda that get these sine functions to all line up with the domain. And then our job is to find coefficients that scale the functions to add them together to get the right answer. Yeah? So do eigenvalues mean like anything physically, or is it just a consequence of the way the problem is set up? So eigenvalues physically mean it is, uh, eigenvalues are the place where the function crosses the root, right? Where the function crosses 0. Physically, what it means I need to maybe draw this a little bit better because it's hard to explain a bad drawing. So physically what it means is if I said I have a sine function and it's doing this, that eigenvalue is constructed such that when I take sine of lambda times my variable x, the, co the, the condition is satisfied. So like looking back what at this, uh, this one here, we enforce, the, we enforce the boundary condition, dt dx at x equals w equals 0, to force the function here to line up, which means actually the lambdas we're solving for would coincide with this point, right? So there's that physical, it's like the physical requirement of meeting the boundary condition. And the lambdas, again, they just scale like where, you know, what's, what's the total length of the period for the sine function or the cosine function. OK, so that's the big picture, right? We're, we're doing this. And incidentally, you know, you think about when you do curve fitting regression, what are we doing? You have a polynomial. It's the same idea. You have a, you know, a times, say, x cubed plus b times x squared plus c times x, right? You're taking this this function that has uh, different characteristics depending on if it's cubed, squared, whatever. And you are finding co uh, coefficients that when you add those functions together give you a new function. It's exactly the same thing. It's what we're doing here. OK. So again, keeping that in mind now, we have our combined solutions. What we have to do for step six is assemble all these individual sine functions into a single uh, thing. Right? So we have our individual sine functions in both in x, and then we have the solution in y, and we multiply those together, and we end up with this, uh, with this solution here, right, which is written out for you. I think I wrote that last time. So we assemble the solutions. What, all that means for this case is that we're taking the model that our actual temperature, which is a function of x and y, is equal to the sum 
of all temperatures Ti, right, for I equals 1 to infinity. Now in practice, um, when you're actually doing the computation, you, you can't do infinity. You have to choose some number of terms that you're going to accept as accurate enough. But what you will observe is that as I goes up, as, this, as the eigenvalues get larger and larger, the constants multiplying the terms should get smaller and smaller. And eventually they become so unimportant to your temperature that you can just stop. Um, the tricky part, as we'll see later, is that's actually position dependent, right? The eigenvalues are going to uh, change based on your position. So uh, you're going to need to, or sorry, the, the constants are going to change based on your position. So you're going to need to decide what's accurate enough based on different positions in the domain. But this is it, right? You're just going through and, and assembling this. So step six is easy, right? We just say we're taking the sum. Conceptually is the hard part. Conceptually, we need to understand what we're doing. Um, okay, what you'll also notice here is that we have only so far enforced these, these boundary conditions, right? We've only enforced x boundary conditions. We have yet to deal with anything in the y direction other than finding the general solution. So that is our next step.